the computer Luddite, so this is a small miracle. Um, these are my disclosures, uh, both research funding and serving in advisory boards and getting honoraria. So what I thought I'd do today is talk about evolution and kind of uh, stick a, to a few themes. Uh, one is anemia, because anemia, in particular for malafibrosis, of course, is a major problem. Uh, more anemia develops as the disease progresses. Anemia is due to the marrow that gets replaced by fibrosis. Anemia can also be due to, of course, due to drug therapy and also due to a big spleen sequestering red blood cells. So this is a, a complex issue. And if you look back in time, you can see that um, what we did back then and we still do now is, of course, give red blood cell transfusions and use red blood cell booster shots like Procrit and Aranesc. Other adjunctive therapies that we've used include what we refer to as amino modulatory drugs with or without steroids, such as thalidomide and lenalidomide. And I would say that this produced a response rate of about 20 to 30 percent. Um, so it could be effective in selected patients. And then kind of moving forward in time, um, both back, you know, two decades ago, but certainly still we use androgens such as danazole. And uh, we have to monitor the liver and monitor for thrombosis, but uh, we can also get about a 20 to 30 percent response rate with drugs like danazole. Now, surprisingly, one of the JAK inhibitors, mamalotinib, in the trials that were performed with the drug, we saw unanticipated anemia improving effects. And ultimately, it was discovered that this works through inhibiting an enzyme called active and receptor like kinase 2, or abbreviated ALK2. And in fact, there's a trial that's now ongoing that's randomizing individuals with myofibrosis to mamalotinib versus damazole to really look at the endpoint of anemia. Now, given that ALK2 was found to be the target of mamalotinib, that in turn led to the development of specific ALK2 inhibitors. And I'll talk briefly about uh, the ALK2 inhibitor INCB00928 that is uh, starting trials very shortly. We also have Luspatercept, which I'll briefly mention, which is what we refer to as an erythroid maturation agent and is currently approved for other diseases and is in trials for myelofibrosis. And of course, uh, we also have a bed inhibitor named CPI0610, which I'll briefly mention as relates to hemoglobin effects. And Dr. Mascarinas will talk more about the drug in his discussion. So this is the uh, specific ALK2 inhibitor called INCB00928. And this is a trial that will look at patients uh, where myelofibrosis patients, where they're given this as monotherapy, but also in combination with ruxolinitib, again, because ruxolinitib is, of course, known to produce anemia in a proportion of patients. Now, ALK2 uh, actually is, an, uh, when you inhibit it, it actually can reduce hepcidin expression. And Susan referred to hepcidin. Hepcidin usually blocks iron from being absorbed from the gut and also keeps iron sequestered in macrophages within the spleen and liver so it's not available. That is, iron is not available to the red blood cell precursors. Um, what an ALK2 inhibitor does is it basically blocks hepcidin and allows iron to be now available to the uh, red blood cells, which might, in fact, improve red blood cell production. So that's some of the rationale behind using an ALK2 inhibitor. So again, this is a trial that will be up and going very shortly. And in fact, some sites might be open at this time. Now, I mentioned uh, the BET inhibitor, CPI0610. And this is uh, some trial data uh, that shows that in patients who start with a baseline hemoglobin less than 10, if you look at the right side of the screen, you can see that you do see um, an increase in time over the hemoglobin. So this is a drug that not only has hemoglobin effects, but also spleen and symptom effects. And John Mascarinas, I suspect, will talk about the fact that this is moving forward in a trial where it's being combined with the rux ruxolinida versus ruxolinida with placebo. This is Luspatercept. This is the trial designed for that drug. And in this trial that's um, ongoing, should be finished accruing shortly, there were four cohorts. There were two cohorts, um, one not receiving rux and the other receiving rux, and whether the patients were receiving transfusion or not transfusion dependent. And this is a drug that can be titrated up with regard to the dose. Patients were monitored for benefit of the hemoglobin or improvement of their transfusion needs. 
and this is just one slide showing that um, you have the people that are in light um, uh, purple, the, the sh you know, which is on the right for each set, which is um, rucks and purple is no rucks. And you can see that those patients that were on rucks, you do see responses that is in cohort 3B that is going up to about 36% in terms of transfusion independence and about 40 to 50% in terms of an improvement of the number of transfusions that is a greater than 50% improvement of red blood cell transfusions. So clearly some activity of loose spatter symptomatic fibrosis. It is of interest that the responses seem to be higher in patients that are transfusion dependent and on RUCs. I'm not sure I can entirely explain that, but I think that enrolling more patients and following them for longer periods of time will help us sort out what the truer response rates are for those on RUCs versus non RUCs versus those getting transfused or just having low hemoglobin not yet receiving transfusions. So stay tuned. So I thought that another uh, very important issue um, in MPNs, of course, is the evolution to acute myeloid leukemia, or what we call blast phase MPN. And again, with the theme of evolution, if one goes back in time, you know, it would pretty much be standard fare to give patients who developed acute leukemia from a myeloplip disorder to give them intensive AML-type chemotherapy, as we would for any patient who had newly diagnosed acute leukemia without an antecedent MPN. Well, that has generally fallen out of favor because response rates and the duration of response and survival really has not been that robust. So then we progressed to using what we refer to as hypomethylating agents, or HMAs. These are drugs whose mechanisms of action is not entirely clear, but we think that they work by, in fact, killing the malignant cells, but also differentiating the cells to make them more mature from the immature cells that they're born from. So there are two drugs that we consider to be cousin drugs because they act very similarly. They're called azacitidine or aza and decitabine or DEC. So those show that they can have some activity in patients with myelofibrosis. We don't really use these in PV and ET. But in fact, when you combine the HMAs, such as aza decitabine with ruxolinitib, you're actually also seeing some uh, fairly decent response rates as well for patients with accelerated or blast phase MPN. More recently, I'd say in the last few years, when we've used these next generation sequencing panels to look for mutations that we can target with therapies, there are proportion of patients with blast phase disease, probably in the range of about 10 to 20%, that will have mutations that we might be able to target. In particular, IDH1 or IDH2, more rarely FLT3, and there are actually new approaches for even targeting P53. With all this having been said, you know, there's still the idea of transplant that we need to think about for patients that are in blast phase MPN, but you can't take someone a transplant that has active AML. You need to get them into a very high quality remission to, to consider to use a transplant to maintain their remission and to try to cure them. So medical therapy, if you can get a good high quality remission, the role transplant can be evaluated if they have a suitable donor, appropriate age and performance status. So this is just a table showing you some of the response rates of three trials, uh, one by Rajit Rampal and colleagues published in Blood Advances in 2018. And in this trial, accelerated and blast phase patients were treated and the response rate was 53% and you can see the median survival was about eight months. Similar theme was continued with uh, John Mascarenas and colleagues, again accelerated in blast phase disease, uh, decided being and was used and uh, with rocks and you got a 44% response rate, a median survival of 10 months. And then finally, again, Bose and colleagues decided being in rocks, 45% response rate and a survival about seven months. So I think that there's a role for a combination of HMA and ruxolinitib or another JAK inhibitor, um, in part because right now we don't have a lot of other therapies that have shown to be uh, robust in their response rates and duration of survival. Now, I don't know how many uh, patients have heard about the drug venetoclax. This is a drug that's approved for some forms of CLL and also for um, older patient AML um, who are not fit for intensive chemotherapy. And this is a, a very important paper that was published uh, mid last year that randomized patients in previously treated older patient AML to azacitidine plus placebo 
versus acetylidine plus venetoclax. And importantly, you see that there was a statistically significant difference in median oral survival, or OS, of about 15 months versus 10 months. And for acute leukemia treatment that does not involve intensive chemo, to get this difference in median oral survival really is a paradigm shift. We always want to do better, but it's a very important step for this group of patients. Now, this is just a um, forest plot, we call it, which shows on the right um, how survival is doing in azacidine and placebo versus the left of a dotted line, how survival is doing with azacidine with venetoclax. And you can see that all the data would suggest an improvement in survival with azacidine plus venetoclax. Some of them are a little bit more statistically significant than others, including those that had an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation. Some like FLT3 or P53 and PM1, um, they seem to survive longer, but it wasn't statistically significant. Importantly, there were some patients that were so-called secondary AML. That means AML that evolved from a myelospotic syndrome or a myeloplift disorder. But there weren't a lot of patients that were treated. And having said that, the survival in these patients were actually better with the combination versus azacitidine plus placebo. So I think that the combination of azacitidine and venetoclax really should be evaluated in patients that have an AML arising from, for example, a mild fibrosis. And so in that regard, um, we at Stanford with our junior investigator, Dr. William Shamali, um, and our co-investigator at uh, UC Davis, Brian Jonas, we in fact are gonna be running an investigator-initiated trial that is supported by AVI, who produces venetoclax to look at the combination of venetoclax and decidabine in patients with post-MPN AML. I know many of my colleagues use this combination off-label. I've done it many times, but this is an opportunity to study it formally to see whether we're really getting a signal of benefit and to see historically how it does compare to azacitidine or decitabine plus ruxolinidin. Now, switching gears just a little bit, there's another type of therapy that is uh, basically what we call um, a um, megrolimab. And just to explain this, there are tumor cells and many types of tumors and malignancies that express on a surface a molecule called CD47. It essentially is a don't eat me signal. And what is it trying to avoid being eaten by? Macrophages. Macrophages are cells of the immune system that recognize tumor cells and basically ingest them and destroy them. And basically tumor cells as a way to evade macrophages express CD47 so they don't get ingested and killed. Well, this therapy called megrolimab is an anti-CD47 antibody that basically prevents the macrophage or you can think of it as a Pac-Man from, it basically takes away the CD47 signal and allows the tumor cell to be eaten and I can definitely see that this is something that we should, as a field, consider for myeloid fibrosis, that is to allow the uh, cells that are suspect, the myeloid fibrosis cells, the blast, to be eaten so we can get some traction on the disease. And this is just some data from a trial of megrolimab plus azacitidine, where we can see that this combination actually produces very reasonable high response rates in people that have poor risk AML, the, that is those that are mutated with the P53 mutation. Usually with those patients, the response rates tend to go down, but at least in the small cohort, there is a signal that the combination of megrolimab and azacitidine seems to overcome the poor risk of a P53 mutation. So I, I hope that in the next year or two that we actually start having trials where we think about adding megrolimab, perhaps to Rux, to Aza, or some other therapy that might be a benefit for our patients with higher risk MF or even progression to AML. Okay, how about we pivot a little bit more and people wanna know, well, what about targeting CalR? Well, CalR is a mutated protein in about 20 to 30% of patients with ET or MF. And you can see on the diagram on the left, it's basically a protein that binds to the MIPL, which is a thrombopoietin receptor in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is this uh, sub-cell organelle right here, they combine it and they're basically shuttled to the surface of the cell. And we know that basically 
mutant Kellar can bind Mipple and stimulate the JAK-STAT signaling process. Also, Kellar is actually secreted from the cell and actually binds Mipple, can also stimulate JAK-STAT signaling that way. So there are several opportunities here to try to block Kellar from causing JAK-STAT activation or, or basically causing a neoplastic cell. One, for example, is to create a peptide or some small molecule to prevent Kel-R from binding the melt receptor here in the ER. And other one is to use an antibody that binds to secreted Kel-R so it can bind to the methyl receptor. And finally, shown here in figure C, is that one can derive peptide fragments from the full-length Kel-R and try to basically vaccinate patients to get a T-cell response to try to uh, get some immune reduction in um, Kel-R's effects on cells that are circulating. So whether it be a small molecule here or an antibody or vaccination, these are strategies that are being developed for patients with Kellar mutant disease. So a lot of hope here. Now, I suspect that a lot of patients and physicians are always asking about, well, you know, we've had two Nobel Prize winners this year uh, with CRISPR-Cas9, and what about genome editing in MPNs? Is it something that could be accomplished? When is it gonna happen? Well, to take a step back, first of all, some exciting news in that it is, of course, in trials right now, and it's in trials for two diseases, that is sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. The first few patients were published in the New England Journal of Medicine just a month ago. And it's worth noting, you know, what are these diseases and how are they different from MPNs? Well, first of all, sickle cell disease and beta thal are inherited diseases, whereas MPNs are acquired diseases. Secondly, there's single gene diseases due to mutations in the beta globin gene, whereas we know with MPNs that yes, it's a lot about JAK2 Kalar Mipple, but as Dr. Nangalia has shown and others have shown, these are multi-mutated diseases. So a single genome editing approach might not of course be necessarily the way to go in MPNs. The other issue is that in beta thal and sickle cell disease, you don't have to fully correct the defect. You can cause some correction and cause substantial improvement in their clinical manifestations of the disease. So the issues in MPNs, and I don't pretend to be a, a CRISPR-Cas9 expert, uh, nor have any experience with gene therapy, but as I see it, the questions might be, who are the optimal MPN candidates? Are you gonna take a lower risk PV or ET patient to gene therapy? Probably not. Again, the issue that these diseases are all multi-mutated just a genome editing, genome editing JAK2 might, of course, not be sufficient. There is a potential risk of secondary acute leukemia from conditioning chemotherapy for the infusion of the stem cells that you edit and put back into patients. So you can never exclude that, although the rates would be uh, high, uh, very low. And then the concern about off-targeted editing. What are the unanticipated effects on MPN hematopoietic stem cells from genome editing? These are early days, so we can't rule out that there are, um, are off-target effects that we still haven't witnessed in beta thal and sickle that might happen in other diseases. So then let's move on a little bit to more aspirational pursuits. This is where Gottlieb goes a little bit out of the box. Maybe uh, um, you might roll your eyes, but let's talk about it. Um, so this is an article um, from VJ Sankran and colleagues that was published uh, late last year, which talks about um, how inherited variants in genes can affect uh, the MPN hematopoietic stem cells. So what, what do we know as background? First of all, we know that the risk of developing an MPN has increased about five to seven fold in first degree relatives of patients with MPNs. Now that sounds like a lot and MPNs is one of the more highly, I would say, uh, more inherited uh, diseases than others in terms of risk. But let me put it into perspective. If the risk of getting an MPN is about two in 100,000 or three in 100,000, that means that the risk would be increased to about 10 in 100,000. So five to seven fold is a, a large relative risk, but the absolute risk is still very low. So I don't want to, of course, alarm the 500 patients that are on this virtual meeting about that. There have been found about 20 genes um, that if they have certain types of variants within them, these are again inherited variants, that they do seem to be associated with an increased risk of developing an MPN. And you can see the list there, and I've highlighted in red, three genes at the end, TERT, CHECK2, and GFI1B. 
But why do I highlight these three genes? I highlight them, one, because again, they're all associated with an increased risk of MPN if there's certain types of variants within them. And number two, the variants that have been found in them seem to be associated with increasing hematopoietic stem cell renewal, meaning that um, the hematopoietic stem cells, instead of being quiet, they seem to uh, produce more of them. And producing more hematopoietic stem cells, in turn, might give more opportunity for mutations such as JAK2, CalR, MIPL, or others to, do, to develop within this larger pool of stem cells. This also goes to the point that Dr. Nangalia brought up uh, this morning is that, well, what might account for the different rates of developing a JAK2 mutation, you know, maybe 18% versus over 200%, you know, per year? And I would submit that maybe part of it is due to these acquired and inherited variants that may increase that risk of higher frequency or the possibility of getting any mutation driving the MPN becoming clinically apparent. So one approach um, would be the following. If you look on the left, you see the hematopoietic stem cells. These variants might increase the pool of stem cells on the left. Maybe there's a way to therapeutically target these variants by correcting them early and reducing the risk of developing an MPN in the future. And perhaps this could be done, for example, with genome editing techniques to edit TERT, to edit CHECK2, to edit GFI1B. So um, again, I think this is very theoretical, but this is something that in fact might be looked at um, in the near future. Now, next, I just wanted to pivot again and talk to you a, a little bit about work that's being done at Stanford and in other places. And that's actually looking at platelets and looking at their protein message or RNA message within them. Why would we do that? Well, as I put in the orange box, the platelet transcriptome, which is just a fancy word for saying the RNA message of platelets, really reflects uh, the cells that they're born from, the megakaryocytes. And we know that megakaryocytes are really an important cell for perpetuating or initiating and perpetuating MPNs. So looking at the RNA message or transcriptome in platelets can provide a snapshot of the underlying hemostatic, thrombotic, and inflammatory abnormalities associated with MPNs and really look at how treatment affects the RNA message within platelets. And so this is work being done by Anandi Krishnan at Stanford. And you can see these four plots, and these are called volcano plots. And what we do is we look at the RNA message within platelets. The red in each plot reflects increases in gene expression in platelets versus controls. And on the left, the blue represents lower gene expression in platelets. And you can see there's volcanic, volcano plots in ET patients versus control on the upper left, PV versus control on the lower left, mild fibrosis versus control on the upper right, and then the effects of RUX treatment versus no RUX treatment, meaning that with RUX, you see decreases in certain proteins shown in blue, and you see increases in protein message shown in the right in red. So we can actually look at the effects of RUX versus no RUX by looking at the platelet RNA in patients over time. And we can look at those different proteins that are um, going up or down, and we can put them in certain biologic pathways. And just as an example, when looking at this somewhat complex figure, if you keep an eye on these here on the left, these lines that end in a filled light blue dot, these are actually the effects of RUX treatment showing decreases, significant decreases in certain types of pathways with RUX treatment. So for example, you see a lot of uh, apoptosis changes, changes in interferon alpha response, and um, different types of pathways that are affected by RUX treatment. So this is very informative to show how we're affecting biologic pathways, and it tells us, well, if this pathway or that pathway is being affected by the drug, maybe we can think about um, other therapies that might impinge upon those pathways, that is, evolving concepts of new therapy for MPNs. So platelet transcriptome or platelet RNA sequencing is one of many ways that we try to identify new targets in patients with MPNs. Finally, I wanted to bring to your attention uh, publications from the last few years on a group of drugs called diabodies. And these are small molecules that can either dial up or dial down the activity of the EPO receptor or the TPO receptor MIPL. And so this is the EPO receptor. And in order for the receptor to work, you need two parts of the receptor to come together. Um, these are two dimers. And when they come together, they, they stimulate and they cause the JAK-STAT pathway to be activated. When they're brought apart, 
like here, then it becomes less activated or unactivated. So there are these diet bodies that actually get in between the two dimers so they can't come together and dimerize and cause JAK-STAT activation. And I kind of think of it, I thought about maybe a, a cartoon way of um, expressing this, and it's kind of like the Wonder, Trim, Wonder Twins. They have to kind of come together and unite by holding hands, and you push them apart by someone like Ruben Mesa getting in between, then you're going to cause a problem and decrease JAK-STAT activation. And these diabodies are really doing what Ruben's doing there. They're keeping these dimers apart so you can activate JAK-STAT pathway. And you can really tailor made any type of diabody and tweak up or tweak down the extent to which these parts of the receptor dimerize. And so again, you can increase their activity or decrease their activity. And the same thing can be true of the TPO receptor in MIPL. Again, looking at the different colors, you can dial down the activity of signaling through the TPO receptor. So for example, on the right here, you can see a lot of megakaryotides being produced by thrombopotin binding to the MIPL receptor. But with these diabodies, it can decrease the megakaryocyte formation uh, by inhibiting stimulation uh, of the MIPL receptor pathway. This was actually tested in two samples um, of patients with ET, one MIPL mutated, one JAK-T mutated, where again, you decrease the number of megakaryocyte colonies by using a diabody that can uh, basically block signaling. So this is, I think, very cool, very exciting, and this is something that might be coming to the clinic hopefully within the next three to five years. So with that, I hope I gave you a flavor of the different interesting and exciting therapies that are being thought about being developed. But you know, when we think about evolving targets for MPN therapy, we also need to, of course, talk about evolving treatment goals. And uh, Ruben and other um, faculty talked about the fact that we're not only paying attention to spleen size and symptoms and cytopenias and fibrosis and mutation burden, we need to be bold. Our patients want us to be bold and start thinking about survival improvement and of course, reducing evolution to acute leukemia. So hopefully some of our newer therapies will achieve that for our patients. And of course, um, I think all of us would agree that in order to make it happen, it needs to be a very close bench to bedside collaboration. So with that, um, I'll end my talk and like to thank my Stanford colleagues, our patients and their families, of course, our dedicated MPN colleagues, and of course, individuals from the MPN Education Foundation for bringing us all together. Thank you so much.